We're going to look this afternoon at Israel and the Middle East and uh, tonight we'll look at Russia and the church. A little bit of Europe but mainly Russia and the church tonight. Now what is interest, what's re- really quite fascinating about doing prophecy talks nowadays is you can do separate subjects but they seem to be overlapping more and more as the years go on. So we'll end up still talking a bit about Russia and the church now and we'll talk a bit about Israel and the Middle East tonight because they're just so intertwined with each other now, a lot more than what they have been, I suppose, in the past. But there is just so much going on. But I want to start with this article which was uh, in the ABC, ABC News, a few months ago. And some of you may have seen this, some of you may have seen a similar article, I think it was in the Australian or the Sydney Morning Herald. It says that Australia is plunging headlong into catastrophe and we are utterly un- unprepared. In fact, we may be past the time when we can prepare. The time bomb is ticking and it will explode in our lifetimes. This isn't mere idle speculation or the rantings of a doomsday cult. This is the warning from a man who made it his life's work to prepare for just this scenario. Admiral Chris Barry was Chief of Australia's Defence Force between 1998 and 2002. Now he says we are sleepwalking towards a conflict that will alter the world as we know it. Now that's the sort of thing that you would think that uh, maybe it was written by a Christadelphian except that we would say of course there is still some time, even if it's short, that we can prepare. But as far as military people in the world in which we live, particularly here in Australia, this man is saying it's almost gone beyond the point at which this world can actually prepare because it's almost upon us. Now here's the, the same, a similar commentary on this in the Australian newspaper. It says that it's an unremittingly grim prospect. It portends potentially Armageddon. And former Defence Force Chief Chris Barry is not alone in sounding the alarm. But, it is the, but is the world really sleepwalking into another war? And will a complacent Australia not be ready when it comes? Few will argue with its assessment. Now, that, that's, this is written in the Australian press. This is the world in which we live. This is Australia in which we live. And it's, it's all before us, isn't it? Now, we know, of course, that this sort of language is used scripturally uh, to speak of the last days, the fact that people will be asleep, that Christ will come as a thief to those who are asleep. But he says, to you who are not, you who are, are, are the brethren, are not in darkness, that, that they should overtake you as a thief. And I want to just speak uh, briefly to start with about the importance of Bible prophecy and why, why are we so interested in Bible prophecy? Because we, okay, we're living right at the last days, but for thousands of years, hundreds, last few hundred years, brothers and sisters have not necessarily been living in the last days. Why is it that we look at Bible prophecy? It's so much more than just saying, well, look, Christ is coming soon. What Bible prophecy does is Bible pro- one of the biggest reasons I believe there is so much prophecy in the Bible is that it helps us to see life in perspective with the plan of God. Now, isn't that true? We see the things happening in a totally different way to how the world sees things happening. And you've got all these people protesting on the streets over moral issues or immoral issues in Australia. Now, we see things completely differently. The church is campaigning vigorously for, for one particular vote. And others are protesting vigorously for another type of vote. But we, the way we see it is we see that, yes, these are concerning, these are very concerning, these are very upsetting things, but Christ is coming back to set up the kingdom. Now, nowhere do the churches speak of that in the discussions over the moral and religious issues that are facing our country at the moment. Nowhere do they speak about the fact Christ is coming to set up the kingdom and it's all over. You, no matter what you vote, it's all over in a moment when Christ steps into the earth, he's going to take control anyway. It's not to say that it's not important, but it is important what's happening. But the fact is we need to see life in perspective. Christ is coming to set up the kingdom. It also, Bible prophecy also gives us confidence in the word of God. It helps us to be moved, it, it, to enthuse, to be moved by what God has said. Noah is an example of that. He was moved to respond to God's word and he built the ark for the saving of his house. It also provides us with a vision of the future. 
Now, we know, of course, Proverbs 29 says that where there is no vision, the people perish. But why is it, have you ever wondered why there are so many scriptures about the coming of Christ in glory with the saints? And and no doubt a number of us have been here over the years and numerous brethren have spoken to us on this subject. Particularly Brother Jim Cowie has done a, a, a large number of studies at this Bible school on that subject. The revealing of Christ and the saints coming in judgment. Why is there so much about that? Well, it's because God knows that we are mortal and we need a vision of the future, that having a powerful vision of the future is very, very important to get our minds off the present and launched into the future. That's why when you read a book like Eureka, Brother Thomas in one chapter, when he deals with Revelation chapter 10, he quotes more than 150 scriptures just in one chapter in relation to the return, the coming of Christ and the saints from Sinai to Jerusalem, 150 scriptures. And the reason he does that is because he's trying to get our minds fixed on the future, not on the present. Because naturally, us as mortal human beings naturally will focus on the present, the things of the present, the trials, the concerns, the, the stresses, the troubles, or in the country in which we live, like of Australia, all the frivolities and the... And the everything that the, that the world may offer. It's so easy to see that as the be-all and end-all. But prophecy helps us to see all that in perspective, that it's just a passing moment. But what prophecy does do, it helps us to learn how God thinks. And I know sometimes people will say, well, look, don't worry, the main lesson is, is that Christ is coming, that's the main reason, and Jesus wins at the end of the day and it's all over. That's all, that's all that matters. But if that's all that matters and that's obviously fundamental and it's it's critical, but why is there so much prophecy in the Bible? Why are there so many hundreds of chapters? It's to help us learn the thinking of God so that we may see the world systems, the religious and political systems, as God sees those systems. So what we're doing this afternoon and tonight is not some sort of just speculative uh, academic exercise. This is to help us get our minds in alignment with God's mind. That's, what, that's the purpose of this, that we may have the mind of God when it comes to these issues, that we might not be just diverted by the things of this world. But it also helps us, and I think we'll see this this afternoon, it helps us to see and appreciate God's love for Israel and God's love for the Ecclesia. Now that's very important. It's not just a matter of saying, well, don't worry, we don't really need to know what's, what's happening and we don't really need to interpret or understand it because at the, day, at the end of the day, Jesus wins anyway. It's, it's, not, it's, it's so much more than that. Prophecy is there that we might develop the love that God has for Israel ourselves and that we might also develop the same love that prophets like Daniel had, like Ezekiel had for the Ecclesia. But really, if I was to say what is the thing that I believe in these last days that prophecy gives us more than anything else? I would have to say it's comfort. There is comfort to hold on to the end. And when we, all of those of us who are going through trials and difficulties and suffering, it really is incredibly comforting to know that God is in absolute control of what is going on. These things are incredibly comforting. The judgments of God on this world are incredibly comforting so that when we feel distressed or we feel absolutely frustrated by what the media is producing in our world, the indoctrination of children in our schools, what is happening in our world, the judgments of God are incredibly comforting and I think as the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more and more prophecy will give us comfort and it is doing so. Now let's go to the great sign of the book of Revelation in the last days, Revelation uh, 16. Because there's one great sign that is given as far as the book of Revelation is concerned just before Christ comes. Now there's many signs but one great sign as far as the book of Revelation is concerned just before Christ comes. And we're going to see that this is directly related to what is happening in Israel and the Middle East. Now we've read, we've read in that article uh, 
this afternoon about sleepwalking to World War III. Well, Revelation 16 tells us in verse 13, in the context of the drying up of the river Euphrates, that I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And those powers representing Russia, Europe and the papacy right across the continent of Europe. And we saw that occur particularly in the late 1980s and the early 1990s with the fall of the communist system and the rising up of um, democracy across Europe and in Russia. But look at it, it says in verse 14, for these are the spirits of demons, literally means demons, demoniacal spirits, working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now it's interesting, over the last few decades we've focused on the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. We've seen the work of the Pope in Poland and the Solidarity Movement, the fall of the communist system, the rise of the church in Russia. But when we keep reading we see that this is something that is going to go worldwide. The spirit of the frogs is revolution and anarchy. It's in the context of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars of Revelation 16. But notice that it says it goes to the whole world to gather the nations to Armageddon. And then Jesus says in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Oh, and by the way, he gathered them into, the, into a, a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It's almost like a passing comment. A little bit like comments like, he made the stars also. A little bit like saying, and they crucified him. It's like, well, you know all about that. You know all about Armageddon. You've already read the Old Testament. You've already read the New Testament. You know what that's about. But the warning of Jesus is, don't be asleep, wake up and see what's going on. Now let's have a look at this because this is the context in which the events in the Middle East are happening today. James 3, which is up there on the screen, says that this demoniac spirit is earthly, unspiritual, demoniacal. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. This is the demoniacal spirit, meaning confusion, or Vine says literally that word means Anarchy or revolution, that's the demoniacal spirit. Anarchy or revolution, literally that's what the Greek word means. It's demoniac. Here's a cartoon that shows us, people understand what the frogs represent. The king's sitting in his bed and they're croaking out the window and he asks the guard and says, do something about the frogs. And the guard says, they're not frogs, they're the peasants. It's like social media, isn't it? The world... Social media is like huge millions of frogs all croaking. Political events presented in the media. Everyone in the world can have an opinion. Everyone can have an opinion. It doesn't matter who you are, you can have an opinion and project it into the world. It's like social media is almost like the ultimate frog spirit vehicle and it's the way in which the revolutions occurred, in fact, in the, in the Middle East when they occurred. It's the promise of freedom just like it was with the plague of frogs in in Exodus chapter 8, the promise of freedom, but it's a false promise. That summary there of the front front page of the Time magazine in 2011 summarises it brilliantly. The spirit of the frogs. It's uh, summarised there by the person of the Times person of the year, the protester. Revolutions in the Middle East in 2011. This is the frog spirits going to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them. Revolution in Libya. Libya is in an absolute mess. In fact, Libya, we'll see, is starting to be taken over by pro-Russian forces at, at, at this moment. There was the Syrian rising in 2011. The spirit of the frogs rising up in Syria against their oppressive leaders like it happened in the French Revolution. They still haven't been successful there, however, although the whole of Syria has completely changed. But in America, we've seen an example in the last 12 months of the frog spirits going out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. And again, this is very important in the context 
of the events in the Middle East because Donald Trump has had a very important part in all the things that have been happening in the Middle East very recently. The Guardian says Donald Trump's victory is nothing short of a revolution. I couldn't believe it when I actually went to buy the newspaper that morning. I thought I'd love to see how they're going to report this event. They reported it in one word, revolution, to which we think, well, of course, that's it. That's the last great sign as far as revelation is concerned to the kings of the whole world. It's an American revolution. Not just Australian newspapers were saying that. In fact, a billionaire businessman is just shown on the front page of The Economist magazine as a, as, a, as a protester, a revolutionary, an insurgent in the White House to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. It's the promise of freedom, but it's a false promise. It's the working class rising up, the blue-collar workers rising up to throw out the political elite. So it's ironic, isn't it, that they use a multi-billionaire to actually do that for them. But this, it's like a revolution against the elite. In fact, their, the election campaign was presented like that. This is not an election. This is a revolution. It's no longer a movement, it's a revolution. It's the spirit of the frogs. It's revolution and anarchy to the world. And we'll see, see this develop, God willing, tonight in our session tonight. Of course, Mr Putin was the first to congratulate Donald Trump. He thought it was fantastic. It was not just Mr Putin. Mr Putin's allies, that man there who was the Speaker of the House for many years, who wrote the, the book The Last Leap South, Vladimir Zirinovsky, who's still a close ally of Mr Putin in the Parliament, drinking with his political allies there, drinking their vodka, celebrating Donald Trump's election. Well, what, what is so significant about that? Well, here's one slide that I think summarises it from Jewish, the Jewish media. Trump officially hands Syria over to Russia and Iran. Isn't that incredible? This is, this is in July. The steering of the diplomatic process has officially been transferred to Russia and Iran while Turkey, the Saudis, Qatar and United Arab Emirates are expected to keep funding their pet militias pointlessly extending the fighting. Trump has made perhaps his most significant decision to date to stop aiding the Syrian militias fighting Assad. The Washington Post said that this decision provided Russia with a final confirmation that it owns Syria. And not only Russia, Iran is also very happy with Trump's decision to pull the rug out from under the dozens of militias still fighting Assad. No wonder the Russians were celebrating when Donald Trump was elected. The Jewish media are now saying that Russia owns Syria. Now let's just recap for a minute because we're really now going to focus on the events in the Middle East. Those are, the, the, the American election is, is very much fundamental to what's going on today in the Middle East and the spirit of the frogs in the Middle East particularly. But when we look at prophecy, we do need to always go back and remind ourselves of the framework of prophecy. And we'll see this develop further tonight, God willing. That the grand theme of prophecy is Babylon versus Zion. It's the system of Nimrod, Babylon, versus Zion. In fact, in the early chapters of Genesis, we've got Nimrod's kingdom in Genesis 10 and 11 and we've got then Abraham who's called out of Babylon in Genesis 12 and 13. And of course, Genesis 14, he meets with Melchizedek, takes bread and wine from Melchizedek after winning the battle of the kings. All the way through scripture, prophecy is about Babylon versus Zion. Whether it be Babylon on the Euphrates in the days of uh, Judah and Judah's fall, or whether it be Babylon the Great in the ter terms of the book of Revelation. It's Babylon versus Zion. Everything fits into that framework. And there is enmity between those two systems because it's the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman. Babylon versus Zion. And particularly I say to the young people, if you can remember nothing else today, but remember that, that prophecy is about Babylon versus Zion and it doesn't matter where you are in scripture, that theme will come out. You go to the end of the Bible and you have the salvation 
of the bride of Christ in Revelation 21 and it comes straight and you've got the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19 and it comes straight after the fall of Babylon. Those scriptures I had, I've got a couple of scriptures here. You go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 11 and 12, that's the one we sing um, about uh, giving elevation to Zion and the, cry out and shout, you inhabitant of Zion. Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah 13, here's the burden of Babylon. See, they're always together, Babylon and Zion. Revelation 17 to 19 is the fall of Babylon. Revelation 21, we could say part of chapter 19 as well is the rise again of Zion. Of course, Zion represents not just natural Israel, but it represents spiritual Zion, which of course we are a part of. And Abraham was called out of Babylon. And that's the point. We are called out of Babylon to be a part of Zion. And that's why Revelation 18 says in the context of the Roman Catholic system and her harlot daughters, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important, again, in the context of what we're seeing in the Middle East. Because what we're about to see now is we're going to see that Britain's role in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia is very important to what's happening towards the gathering of the nations for Armageddon. We've seen the vote, the Brexit vote in Britain. Britain, of course, is slowly moving towards an exit from the European Union. But leaving Babylon is never easy. It's never an easy process. It's a slow process. But Tarshish, of course, we know from Ezekiel 38 and other scriptures like that one we read this afternoon, Tarshish was never a part of the Holy Roman Empire and it will not be part of the beast at Armageddon. Britain, we believe, the Tarshish power, the latter-day Tyre power, will support Zion. Britain will ally herself not with Babylon but with Zion. Now, that's why that's why it's important that Britain comes out of the European Union. It's important because Britain is with Israel at the time of the end. It's with Zion. God will use a nation with Protestantism as its foundation to help guide the Jews home at the beginning of the kingdom. And we're seeing that process starting now. Britain cannot be a part of Catholic Europe at the time of the end because Britain is a part of Zion, not a part of Babylon. And here's a... Cartoons often tell the whole story, don't they? Here's a headline from the UK Daily Telegraph only a few weeks ago with a Roman emperor out the front there saying, I have a vision for the EU and the headline is the United States of Europe. Jean-Claude Juncker today called for an ever more powerful European Union and warned that Britain would regret Brexit in a defiant speech that was branded a blueprint for a United States of Europe. So Britain's getting out of Europe. It's got to be, part, got to be with Zion, not with Babylon. And by Britain leaving the European Union, it has galvanised European states to urgently work towards joining closer together in the United States of Europe, as we would expect from Revelation 17, as we would expect, in fact, from Revelation 16, that the beast, the beast of the earth or Holy Roman Empire is there at the time of Armageddon. This is what they're doing. But what's Britain doing in, in, in this process? Well, the current, so the current Prime Minister, her position is quite tenuous. Theresa May, she has only a few weeks ago said that Israel is a remarkable country. She says, we look forward to May marking the centenary of the Balfour Declaration in November. Born of that letter, the pen of Balfour, and of the efforts of so many people, is a remarkable country. May also reinforced her support of the Zionist nation, stating, as Prime Minister, I'm proud to say that I support Israel, and it is absolutely right that we should mark the vital role Britain played a century ago in helping create a homeland for the Jewish people. Boris Johnson as well, British Foreign Secretary. There he is at the Wailing Wall. He's been criticised as being an outspoken friend of Israel. He has an infectious enthusiasm for Israel. 
And while you know, leaders will come and go, parties will come and go, elections will come and go, we believe at the end Britain will be with Israel against Great Babylon at the time of the end. She will be humbled. The ships of Tarshish will be smashed as, I, as it says in Isaiah and in the Psalms. But she will be with Israel at the end. And this really brings us, I suppose, to Sheba and Dedan. We know from Ezekiel chapter 38, Sheba and Dedan. Let's just go there. And Ezekiel 38 is well known for us, to us, so we will just mention this briefly. But Ezekiel 38 mentions Sheba and Dedan, which is the area of Saudi Arabia and the, and the Gulf states, with the merchants of Tarshish at the end, at the time of Armageddon. This is quite fascinating because they really have not much to do at Armageddon. It says in verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, notice that they're mentioned first, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all her young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, that's under Russia, art thou come to take a spoil? Have you gathered a company to take a prey, to gather away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take away a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it? Gog knows exactly that they're dwelling safely. He's probably had a grand part of causing that to come about. But Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia and Great Britain will meekly say, what what are you doing? Why are you coming? We didn't expect you to do this. And God says, you've come against my land. There's something very personal in that, isn't it? God says, this is my land. Don't you know? You know, don't you, Gog? You know they're dwelling safely. You've had a hand in this. This is a deception. We're going to come to that uh, in a moment. Now what's interesting about Sheba and Dedan, and that's the scripture there on the screen, is Genesis 25, (coughs) is that these are children of Abraham. Abraham took a wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Median, etc. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. So we know that Sheba and Dedan are children of Abraham. Now that's very important because as children of Abraham we believe that they will be with Israel at the time of the end. And I'd love to turn these up but we just don't have time to do it. But I think it's very important. 1 Kings chapter 10 and you'll get a copy of all these slides if you like. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll hand these uh, to Dave. 1 Kings 10. When the Queen of Sheba, this is Solomon's kingdom, heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to prove him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. Blessed be Yahweh thy God, which delighteth in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because Yahweh loved Israel forever. Therefore made he king, the king, to do judgment and justice. So you've got this picture this here of the Queen of Sheba coming to Solomon's kingdom. It was not just, this is not just a, a, a trading alliance. This is something where Sheba is involved with praising the God of Israel. Solomon's kingdom we know as a type of the kingdom of God under Christ. Many kings came to visit Solomon. It says that lots and lots of kings came to visit Solomon, but only two are mentioned. There's the king of Tyre and the queen of Sheba. Now, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we know as a type of the last days, there will be a Sheba, Tarshish or Tyre alliance in the last days who will ultimately be on Zion's side when the kingdom is set up. 1 Kings chapter 10 continues and says, She gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices very great store, precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram 
We know that that's king of Tyre, 1 Kings chapter 9, that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir a great plenty of Almug trees and precious stones. Beside that he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia. Notice the, 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 the similarities with the time of the end. We know, and we'll see this in a minute, that Isaiah 23 tells us that the tire of the latter days is Great Britain. There it is there, Isaiah 23. The burden of Tyre. And Tyre was to fall. Judgment was going to come on Tyre. But the spirit of Tyre, the merchant power of Tyre, would pass over to Tarshish. Isaiah 23 verse 6. Tarshish is the latter day Tyre. Tarshish is closely involved with Sheba and Dedan as we've seen in Ezekiel 38 as is also there interestingly in type 1 Kings chapter 10. Psalm 45 which is the psalm about the marriage of Jesus Christ to his bride in that context says and the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Now, isn't that interesting? So, you've got a latter-day daughter of Tyre, the spirit of Tyre, which we know as Tarshish. We're not just guessing because Psalm 72 tells us that Tarshish and the Isles will give presents. Here's Psalm 72. In his days shall the righteous flourish and the abundance of peace. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea. This is Jesus Christ. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the Isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. See, it's the latter day Tyre-Israel-Sheba alliance. There is a very close link between Sheba and Tarshish, both historically and in the future. And that's why Tarshish is mentioned with Sheba and Dedan in Ezekiel 38. Now, this is the reading we read uh, already this afternoon. Isaiah 60. All they from Sheba shall come. This is the kingdom chapter. You picked that when we, saw it, when we read it today? They shall offer gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of Yahweh. Surely the isles shall wait for me. And the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far. To their silver and gold with them to the name of Yahweh thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. So we are expecting to see in the last days Britain with, with Saudi Arabia and at least some of the Gulf states to be on the side of Zion, not Babylon, at the end. And in Isaiah, if we went to Isaiah 21, we would see that the blessings of the kingdom are given to Arabia and Dedan because they have cared for the Jews fleeing from the Battle of Armageddon. Now, that's, that's something you can read in your own time. Arabia is made like a beautiful forest because they have cared for the Jews. They have been with Israel when Armageddon has come about. And the fact that Solomon's reign is, is, is there's, there's many dozens of scriptures that show that his reign is a type of the kingdom of God. And that's why I believe, and I believe very strongly, that it is quite appropriate, as we've always believed, for the book of the Song of Solomon to relate to Jesus Christ and the Ecclesia. And I know that some say that Solomon, some would say that Solomon cannot be a type of Christ because he went away and followed foreign women. That cannot be the case because there are dozens and dozens of scriptures that speak about Solomon's kingdom as a type of the kingdom of God. Not just Solomon's kingdom, but Solomon himself, as we see there in Psalm 72. In his days shall the righteous flourish. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. Yes, Solomon did stray as David did. But his kingdom is a type of the kingdom of God. And, so, and there's many, many things we could talk about in that regard. I'd be happy to talk to you further about that. But wh- how does this fit in to what we're seeing happening today? Well, Great Britain and Saudi Arabia historically have had a close relationship back when the Queen went to Saudi Arabia in the 1970s, really started things off. 
But it's more than just since the 1970s because going back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were many British protectorates in the Gulf region. Those countries there you'll see from the late 1800s and the early 1900s, Kuwait, Qatar, etc. There was the Trucial States there in the area um, in the middle there, which was a, was a truce, was created, and a lot of that was simply because Britain were protecting her, uh, Britain was protecting her uh, shipping routes because of her ships. I won't really read all that there, but from the, a summary of Saudi-British relations. Margaret Thatcher went in 1985 and secretly, apparently a lot of it was secretly done, where there were arms deals made with the Saudis which uh, since then have brought in over $43 billion in revenue to Great Britain and to the arms um, of of Great Britain. Quite fascinating to look back on the history of that. But that, um, just a a summary from Wikipedia, showing that Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have long been close allies. Going back to the First World War, um, 1915, the Treaty of Darren, etc., etc. You can read all about that. Very interesting. But what's happening now with Britain and Tarshish? Well, Britain as Tarshish and the Gulf states. Well, less than two weeks ago, Britain has signed a military cooperation deal with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and Britain signed a framework deal for military cooperation. The Saudi state media said on Tuesday, just two days after Gulf rival Qatar signed a deal to buy jet fighters from the European nation. The agreement came after Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman discussed security ties with visiting British Defence Secretary in the Red Sea port city of Jeddah. During the meeting they reviewed bilateral relations, particularly the mechanism joint coordinations in the field of defence. So we've got Britain very much involved at the moment militarily with Saudi Arabia and there's a reason for that, which we'll see in a tick. There are big changes happening in Saudi Arabia. Very, very big changes. Now, this is the Weekend Australian. I think this is actually actually in the editorial or by the foreign editor of the Weekend Australian, only in June. Now, just look at the words that he uses here. He says, It would be hard to overstate the significance of the sudden upheaval. You think the sudden upheaval is there? Sudden upheaval is everywhere. Here's one in Saudi Arabia. A sudden upheaval in the House of Saud that has seen reformed-minded Mohammed bin Salman, 31, leapfrogged into the job of Crown Prince and King-in-waiting of Saudi Arabia. His ideas contradict much of the arch-Islamic conservatism that has dominated the Arab world's most powerful Sunni state since 1932. His elevation holds the prospect of major change, not least in Saudi Arabia's attitude to Israel, and its determination to contain Shia Iran's ambitions. He's very close to the US President, Trump. He sees eye to eye with Washington on the need to thwart Russian influence in the Middle East, the importance of toppling the Assad regime in Syria and the need for stronger action against Islamic State and other terrorists. Reports suggest that he has held secret talks with senior Israeli leaders with a view to establishing links. Officials in Jerusalem have warmly welcomed his appointment and applauded his tough stand against Iran. Now, isn't that interesting? A sudden upheaval in Saudi Arabia. And the Wall Street Journal has said that for the Gulf states, Israel is now emerging as an ally. Sunni monarchies led by Saudi Arabia increasingly see the Jewish state as a partner in a common struggle against Shiite Iran. An unlikely partnership. Everything seems unlikely today, doesn't it? Upheavals, dramatic events. This is an unlikely partnership. He's the architect of the Yemen war fighting uh, 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 Iranian rebels in in Yemen. He wants a more vigorous response to Iran and it has received new momentum since the election of Donald Trump. How about that? Since Donald Trump's election, it's received new momentum. I think things are starting to become clearer for us, aren't they? Here's Middle East Monitor news site saying that Saudi plan to accept Israel as a brotherly state. This is only two weeks ago. 
He's working to westernise the kingdom. He's actually, the main thing uh, that was reported only recently last week was that he's now allowed women to drive in Saudi Arabia. It sounds a pretty obvious thing, but this is where, the, where they've been at for so many years. They're working to westernise the kingdom and change people's mindsets when it comes to Israel. The account which is believed to be reporting inside the ruling family in Saudi Arabia wrote, Arrangements amongst the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain is wider than our expectations. Israel and American bodies linked to Trump are involved. The plan is complete. It's based on unifying the basis of security, media, culture and education, including religion, in Egypt and the Gulf states, except Oman. So there's big changes happening. And a part of this was when Donald Trump went to the, believe it or not, Islamic, the Islamic summit in the Middle East, with which was with about um, roughly, this is in May. In May, the Riyadh summit was about 50 Islamic nations, more generally more moderate nations, when Donald Trump spoke to them about his vision for the Middle East. It was a series of three summits held in May on the occasion of the visit of Donald Trump to Saudi Arabia. The summit included a bilateral meeting between US and Saudi Arabia, two multilateral meetings, one between the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council and the other with Arab and Muslim countries. Leaders and representatives of 55 Arab Muslim countries were in attendance. It's just extraordinary, isn't it? These are moderate, predominantly Sunni Arab nations, that we accept, many of which we expect to be with Israel at the time of the end. He went to Israel as well in May and he said that concerns about an Iranian regional threat were driving Israel and the Arab states closer together. I won't read all that there but it, it, it's, it's very clear that their hatred and worry and more their, they're very frightened of Iran's influence in the Middle East that it's driving the moderate Arab states together with Israel. We know from Daniel chapter 11 that there will be the king of the south in opposition to the king of the north. Great Britain in Egypt and aligned with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states resisting, hopelessly resisting as it will end up being, the Russian-backed Iranian-dominated Shia crescent to the north. And that's, you see how the picture's forming? It's forming just as we would expect it. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? And there's big steps being made only in very recent months. So really when we see that map, we've seen over the last 10 years or so the north and south alignment very much dominated by Sunni versus Shia with the Shia nations, Shia Islam nations in the north, particularly dominated by Iran and to a lesser extent Iraq, but the more moderate Sunni nations to the south. Of course, there's extreme Sunnis, which uh, is is Islamic State. They seem to hate everybody and want to fight everyone. But the Shia states, uh, predominantly such as Egypt and um, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, are very worried about Iran's spreading influence, particularly in Syria. And it's interesting that the Shia doctrine, or Shiite, doctrine is that they believe that the hidden imam, it's like their messiah, he's a ninth century descendant of the prophet Muhammad, will return to earth at some time in the indefinite future. They see the destruction of Israel, even if it leads to world war, as a fulfilment of prophecy and as a means of hastening the imam's return. So the Shiite Muslims in the north believe that there has to be a world war and the destruction of Israel to bring about the coming of their messiah. That's their messiah, the hidden imam. Now you can see why the Shiite Muslims are a lot more um, generally and and will be certainly when it comes to Armageddon will be the aggressor with Russia. And the big threat really, the big news of the last couple of years really and particularly this year is the great battle between Iran and Saudi Arabia. In fact they're very worried that there could be a war between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the near future. In fact, the new prince, Salman, which we mentioned before, has actually said for the first time, he has said that he would be prepared to take the war with Iran inside the borders of Iran if necessary. Now, that's quite dramatic. 
It's a new Middle East. And this is quite amazing. This is the way the Jerusalem Post depicts this. And this is to do with the Iran and Saudi Arabia drama. Israel has suddenly found itself by default courted by major countries in the Sunni Arab world. This development offers Israel several achievements. First, recognition as an important player in the Middle Eastern arena. Second, if cooperation in the past focused on the minorities, now Israel has penetrated the core Sunni Arab world. Third, while Israeli-Arab cooperation occurs, mainly behind the scenes, some elements are currently rising to the surface. The new public visibility of cooperation between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states is intentionally designed to intimidate their common enemy, Iran. So can we, see, we can see, can't we, that there is developing a very strong north-south alignment like we would expect from Daniel 11 and from Ezekiel 38. It's a new Middle East. Everything's changing. And Donald Trump has been very much a part of that change in such a short amount of time. The Jerusalem Post also said, in the Middle East, it's a tale of two bridges. We could say King of the North, King of the South or a North-South alignment. It says that Israel is working to prevent a Shiite corridor in the region, that's across the north, while building links with Sunni Arab states. That's to the south. The first land corridor, the one which worries Israel, is what it calls the Shiite Crescent. It has come about through Iranian efforts to take advantage of civil wars in Syria and Iraq. Tehran aspires to establish direct land links from Iran via Shiite controlled areas in Iraq to Syria and then on to Hezbollah, its ally in Lebanon. Therefore, giving it a foothold in the Mediterranean. Iran is a foe of both Israel and Saudi Arabia. So there we, we're there, we seeing this new alignment forming. There is, of course, there has been the war in Yemen. The war in Yemen has simply, I suppose, been Saudi Arabia fighting against pro-Iranian rebels, really, who have re, uh, Iranian-backed rebels who have wanted to take, really have wanted to take that little country just there, just to the south. Iran would love to, of course, have a country to the south of Saudi Arabia by where it has a foothold on that peninsula. That's what the war's been about. It's Saudi Arabia and Iran. And there there's been Operation De- uh, Decisive Storm, a coalition of countries led by Saudi Arabia over the last two years launching airstrikes against Iranian allied rebels. So this is what, what's happening in the Middle East today. It's a, it's a north-south alignment, a Saudi Arabia versus Iran alignment. And there's a picture of Donald Trump there with, at the Arab Islamic American Summit in Saudi Arabia back in May. I think I've got a short little video here which I'll play, which actually it just has his little, uh, some of Donald Trump's comments. America is prepared to stand with you in pursuit of shared interests and common security. But the nations of the Middle East cannot wait for American power to crush this enemy for them. The nations of the Middle East will have to decide what kind of future they want for themselves, for their country, and frankly, for their families and for their children. It's a choice between two futures, and it is a choice America cannot make you. A better future is only possible if your nations drive out the terrorists and drive out the extremists. Drive them out. Drive them out of your places of worship. Drive them out of your communities. Drive them out of your holy land. And drive them out of this earth. Interesting, isn't it, the way things are going? So where does Israel fit in with all this? Well, Israel is very worried about Iran as well. Only six weeks ago, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that Israel were threatening a strike within Syria and Israel, Mr Netanyahu, told Russia that Iran is a greater threat than IS and Mr Netanyahu said 
that Israel will act independently if it needs to. He was prepared to act unilaterally to prevent an expanded Iranian military presence in Syria. And it's interesting that Israel bombed Syrian chemical weapons sites only two weeks after that event. Mr Netanyahu went and warned Mr Putin that they will act against uh, they will act in Syria if forced and they did two weeks later. And of course they, they went to uh, Sochi, the Black Sea Resort and uh, Mr Netanyahu warned that Iran was fighting to cement an arc of influence from the Gulf to the Mediterranean and is worried about Russia and how Russia will uh, really, whether Russia will allow that. Which of course brings us to this point about Ezekiel 38. We have this position in Ezekiel 38 where Israel will dwell safely. And of course there's a lot of debate about what that means exactly. Um, I personally think that dwelling without walls and gates is a contrast to the time when Israel used to dwell with walls right around their cities in the time as with the fall of Jericho. Jericho is used as a type of the Battle of Armageddon. Now I'm sure there may be some walls that have been built that may need to come down. I think we'll only know when it actually happens. But what is certain is that Israel in the Ezekiel 38 are dwelling confidently and are unexpectedly, very unexpected of the Russian invasion. We have pictures there, which we'll see a little video tonight actually, of Mr Putin at the Western Wall with the Jews and they're actually showing him the model of the Temple Mount, showing him around Jerusalem and the Israelis are saying, look, Russia is here to stay in the region. We're going to have to make friends. We've got to reach out. So before Russia goes and drops bombs in Syria, they go to Russia first to tell them. Maybe this is the start of this confidence that Israel has. Of course, a lot of it's about oil and gas, the fact that Israel are uh, developing the gas fields and oil fields off the coast of Israel, some of which Russia are involved with. Russia certainly want to get a lot more involved with that than what they even are presently. Here's a little video showing Mr Netanyahu and Mr Putin meeting earlier in the year. Russia's attempting a difficult balancing act in the Middle East, trying to maintain good relations with both Israel and Iran. So far, it's doing a fairly competent job. I am very pleased to note that we have established very close and very confidential contact. We meet on a regular basis and are constantly in touch by telephone. But the Israeli Prime Minister has serious concerns about Tehran's growing influence, which he put diplomatically to Putin before the two began their meeting. We would not like radical Islamic Sunni terror to be replaced by radical Islamic Shia terror under the leadership plan of Iran. Particularly concerning for Jerusalem is the arms Shia group Hezbollah fighting for Assad's governments near the Israeli border. To counter the threat of the Iranian proxy, the Israeli military has stepped up operations into Syria. This is moments after Israeli fighter jets struck a military airport on the outskirts of the Syrian capital Damascus. Over the last few years... So, Russia, Israel and Iran are braced for the end game in Syria as that headline there shows. Russia may soon find it impossible to pursue a policy in Syria that accommodates Israel as well as its enemies. And as that article there says from Al Jazeera, it says that Prime Minister Netanyahu's one day visit to Moscow, that's back in March, was the latest round in the ongoing coordination established in September 2015. The summit was conducted in a very positive atmosphere and Mr Netanyahu attaches great importance to reaffirming the basis for synchronisation with Vladimir Putin. So I think what we're starting to see, and those of you who were at the last Bible school who heard uh, Brother Jim's studies on on the history of of Israel and of of the time of Hezekiah, would know how uh, extremely interesting that is as we see Israel now reaching out really hoping to put its trust in Russia to protect it from this emerging threat just north of its border on the Golan Heights. And 
Israeli media says that Israel will have to live with Russian dominance on its border. Mr Putin has just signed a Syrian-based deal cementing Russia's presence there for half a century. Now think of that. Russia has just signed a deal to cement Russia's presence in, in Syria for at least half a century and it's with options for further time periods. So, brothers and sisters, I think we're, we can see that these things are dramatically moving towards the expected outcome. And the expected outcome is that Yahweh will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of Yahweh. And so, brothers and sisters, let us be comforted, let us be encouraged and take a lot of comfort in the fact that all those things we have talked about for so many decades are now just fitting together as we would expect and uh, tonight, God willing, we will look and at further the development of Russia's role in the region of the Middle East, particularly uh, allied with the church. Thank you.